organizing in a Trump and Amazon world. New concentrations of power are bringing forth new models of resistance. This week on the show, Kathy Elbiza and Sabino Milian discuss the targeting of activists in immigration sweeps. Those ICE raids aren't that random, they say. And as Amazon gets ever bigger, what happens to the workers behind your mouse click? We'll hear how low-wage warehouse workers are raising the floor. It's all coming up on The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. With Trump's Muslim ban stymied for now in the courts, media coverage of the immigration issue is quieter. But raids by ICE, that's Immigration and Customs Enforcement, are continuing, and not just on a random basis, say activists. In case after case, people are being targeted, not just because of their papers, but also, many think, because of their organizing. And ICE raids are becoming intimidation tactics, affecting not just workers, but the movements they're a part of. Kathy Albisa is the executive director of National Economic and Social Rights Initiative, a nonprofit working with many of these workers. And Sabino Milian is a member of Brand Workers, a nonprofit organization bringing local food production workers together for good jobs and a sustainable food system for all of us. Thank you both for coming in. Glad to have you. So let's start, Kathy, with what you're seeing. What's happening out there? Well, we've seen some troubling incidents and we're trying to figure out what you know what what level of significance they have like what there's a very high profile uh, taking into custody of Kiki Balcasar in Vermont so Kike is a leader in the milk with dignity campaign and he was uh, taken into custody right after a meeting right? it did not feel random and it's not the first time that migrant justice members have found themselves picked up as if somehow ICE knew exactly what their meeting schedules mm. were. Now, Milk with, Just, with, Milk with Dignity was one of the migrant worker-dominated organizations that worked in broad progressive coalitions in Vermont. Yes, it's Migrant Justice, and their campaign is Milk with Dignity. And they are basically taking a, a page from the Coalition of Immokalee Worker playbook and trying to establish a worker-driven social responsibility program in Vermont Dairy so where workers are having a meeting they're having a meeting and as they walk out there were ICE agents specifically to pick up the spokesperson for the campaign previously people have been picked up after coming from a jobs with justice meeting right out of the airport very very questionable experiences uh, we've also seen in other parts of the country workers getting picked up when they're going through basic processes to exercise their labor rights. There was a story out of Massachusetts. That's right. So it, uh, lawyers in Massachusetts say this is unprecedented. A worker that was injured, entitled to workers' comp after working for many years in the state, shows up to settle a claim with, employ with his employer who had not bought insurance and was out of compliance, and instead of his employer showing up, immigration agents are there. So how do you explain that? What's your hypothesis of what's going on? Well, formally, the federal government takes the position that they do not uh, target people for deportations based on their political beliefs. And certainly, they would say that they don't target people because they exercise their basic rights. But whether or not, my, my feeling is whether or not it is a conscious and intentional choice, once I start responding to abusive employers who are retaliating against workers for exercising their basic rights or for expressing their political beliefs or for addressing conditions that are frankly subhuman in much of our low-wage worker force, they have become an agent of abusive employers and not a representative of the people of this country. And not just abusive employers, but those who would seek to intimidate movements. Because That's what right. you've described, and I've heard from other sources, is the impact goes well beyond that one person who's targeted in the raid. Absolutely. In Vermont, it's really chilled a number of 
of uh, efforts to push out the Milk with Dignity campaign. Workers with families, workers with children, they need to be concerned. You can't, it's not easy to take that kind of risk. Kike is still all over the country speaking. But that's, a, that's mm. a, a quite a decision to make, knowing that you are being watched by ICE. Kathy, introduce us to Sabino a little bit. Tell our audience a little bit about the fight and the victory that's represented uh, right here. Yeah, well, Sabino was, was uh, que, que le explique la victoria que ha tenido y, y, y lo que han hecho. He was explaining to me that they received summary notice, present your paper in 10 days or you're out. And uh, you can imagine there, there was very little to do from a legal perspective. So he was telling me they organized. They organized, they were supported by brand workers. Uh, they were organized by brand workers. They had allies, they had the community. And shockingly, they backed off. The company backed off. ¿Y qué pasó después que la compañía no te lo pidieron los papeles después? No. No, they simply um, ceded and no longer asked for those papers. So turning to Sabino, what are you witnessing, what are you observing in the brand workers' work that you do in this context? Yo he visto que Brand Workers es una organización que lucha por los derechos de los trabajadores. Este ha afectado mucho porque uno anda con, con temor, no sabe si van a llegar a los trabajos de uno a agarrarlo o si ya no va a regresar a la casa. Uno no sabe si el momento que uno está eh, organizando, organizado en algún grupo, uno no sabe si, si va a llegar a eso o lo van a agarrar. I mean, clearly is a big challenge. Mm -hmm. How do you and the folks at Nestre work with organizations like Sabinos to fight back or respond in this kind of context? Yeah, I think that at a moment like this, what was really uh, extraordinary was the groundswell of support for Kike mm. and for Sule when they were taken. It was, it was clearly recognized that this was not just a, a random deportation. There were thousands of people who responded and there were, I think, a thousand people outside their hearing. It's a moment where solidarity is called for because that is the only way these abusive agencies under this administration are going to back down even an inch, right? They Initially, they didn't even want to give Zuli bail. She has no record. There's nothing to indicate that she should be kept, but somehow they were withholding bail from her. But it was really the solidarity, the ability of movements to come together, the immigration movement, the workers' rights movement, the human rights movement in general, along with uh, allies, right? This is a moment the allies really need to step up when communities are so vulnerable and their, their voices are being silenced. What is the alternative model? I mean, what are some of the stories you're hearing where the organizing you're describing is scoring some victories even in this climate? I mean, brand workers is one. You managed, your organization managed to score some victories even in this climate. How? Sí, eh, el, el, hemos ganado mucho porque nos hemos sabido organizar gracias a la organización que nos ha apoyado en todo momento. What happened? What, what did you have to organize about? What was the problem? Los problemas que bien que, que tuvimos en el trabajo porque nos habían dado una una carta, de una carta donde nos daban 10 días para presentar nuestro estatus y de lo contrario íbamos a ser despedidos. Luego nos, contact, nos, nos contactamos con Brand Worker para, y, nos, y nos organizamos. Y nos organizamos y tuvimos una, hicimos una, una protesta frente a, a la panadería. So, I mean, this is a great example of you can make progress even in these times. But I'm struck by the fact that most of the stories that I'm hearing of progress and innovative organizing are coming as Sabino said, from fairly small organizations, grassroots groups, communities in organization, not so much from big labor. What's going on? Oh, I mean, big labor is definitely under attack, right? And has been for many years, and you can only imagine that it's intensifying. And it, it certainly doesn't help grow big labor that so much, so much of our workforce is almost impossible to organize and unionize through formal channels. So the worker center movement has stepped in 
uh, to fill that void, right? To work side by side with big labor and shift the landscape. And what, what I think happens with the worker center movement is you basically have a group of workers who are the most marginalized workers in this country. I'll give you some examples in Vermont, just, just a little example. In Vermont, it's not unusual for a worker not to have an eight hour break in a 24 hour period. So you'll have to sleep in three hour chunks. Uh, we, you know, these things are standard in the business. And so workers are willing to step up because they have at this point so little to lose. For example, we were speaking to workers in Chicago and uh, workers organizing in the temp sector in different parts of the country. And when the administration came into power, we said, what are you concerned about? What additional types of repression do you fear might come down the pike? And they, it was, the answer was devastating. They said, you know what? We don't even know what they could throw at us next. They've thrown everything at us. And this was even before Trump came into power. We started saying, well, what about deportations and raids? And said, well, we're already <laughs> suffering that. Uh, what about retaliation? Well, we're already suffering that. What about, you know, everything from stolen wages to violence to sexual harassment. So this group of workers has every reason to want to stand up and push back as hard as possible. And it is a very multicultural movement, so we're bringing organizing strategies from all over the world. So that's the last part I wanted to ask you about, and that is the global nature of this. I mean, where do the workers that are brand worker members come from in terms of the world? Where are your members from? So Guatemala, Salvador, Honduras, sí, muchos, muchos países. So this is a global shift of workers, a global mm -hmm. phenomenon that people are, uh, uh, that we're all witnessing. What lessons do you draw from that? Because the lesson being drawn by the Trump administration is build walls, keep people out. And a lot of people, even within the labor movement, are thinking that's the way to go. We need to keep our workers legal, secure, build walls around our workplaces. We, our board chair, uh, Nezri is a, a wonderful uh, scholar. He's a labor economist. And he, when we were talking about this, he said, Kathy, it's a paradox, but believe it or not, the, the, the fewer restrictions you have on workers being able to go where they need to go, the more protection all workers will have. Yes. And, and I said, Patrick, how could that be? And he said, because capital can travel freely wherever it wants. Goods travel more freely than people. The only people that have restrictions are, the only ones suffering restrictions are workers. So what happens is capital follows the most abusive working conditions to exploit workers. If workers had the freedom to leave those places, capital would lose that leverage. That's, that's his perspective. Um, and speaking to a lot of progressive economists, they actually talk about a very open immigration policy ultimately being the better longer term strategy to bring labor standards up here and around the world. It is a global problem. We cannot solve it by being made in the USA. We need to solve it with a global solution. And in the short term? In the short term, I, as I said, at this moment in time is a moment for real solidarity and weaving together our movements. It's a moment where the immigration issues, the workers' rights issues, the gender issues, the race issues have come together in a particular toxic brew. The, the, the strange, maybe, opportunity that that brings up is that it, it brings us all closer together to respond. As I said, the, the solidarity with migrant justice, and these are workers that 15 years ago you wouldn't have seen in Vermont, as you said, the world has changed, has been beautiful. Beautiful is just the only word that comes to mind. The outpouring of love and support is, I think, the beginning of changing this sort of supremacist, toxic environment that this administration is moving forward. Beautiful. Kathy Sabino, thank you so much. It's not just ICE raids. A new report exposes how companies breed fear among low-wage workers through illegal retaliation against those who try to stand up for their rights. In Illinois, it wasn't big labor, but an alliance of community-based workers groups who compiled a report. In Chicago, I had a chance to hear more from Sophia Zaman, Alliance organizer. Raise the Floor is 
I would call it, right, the next step in the worker center movement. Um, and so worker centers have been around uh, for about the past decade, um, and they sort of emerged to respond to the changing nature of our economy, in which you know multinational corporations are moving freely across borders, uh, jobs are getting outsourced across seas, and the work here that's available is low-wage, low-quality positions. And the people who usually occupy those jobs are immigrants, people of color, and, and other communities of color. And unfortunately, those folks, those communities, have always been on the margins of sort of strong unions core. And I say that as someone as a former or union organizer with a lot of love. Um, but there's just sort of cultural nuances and um, cultural barriers, right, to participating in traditional labor movements. And so worker centers emerged to respond to this crisis of our economy and a crisis of the labor movement. And so um, in Chicago, there are eight worker centers that are organizing across various low-wage industries, anything from uh, restaurant and retail to warehousing and manufacturing, uh, domestic work and cleaning, uh, day labor, uh, and uh, formerly incarcerated workers who are experiencing their own barriers. And um, Raise the Floor's purpose was sort of to unite these eight worker centers around shared issues that all low-wage workers are experiencing, issues of wage theft or discrimination or uh, unsafe working conditions and retaliation. In Chicago, um, we have a thriving worker center movement. There are actually eight worker centers that span across geography and industry. So um, some worker centers are organizing by neighborhood, like South Southeast Chicago, where there aren't a lot of resources. Some uh, worker centers are organizing by identity, like the Worker Center for Racial Justice, which is form, uh, organizing um, returning citizens, formerly incarcerated workers. Um, and some worker centers are organized by industry, like the Chicago Workers Collaborative that's organizing in the temp staffing industry or the Warehouse Workers for Justice or Rock Chicago Restaurant Opportunity Center. Um, and what's so unique about Raise the Floor is that this is the first time that worker centers have come together in this kind of, not just coalition, but alliance. Chicago is so important um, to the economy because it's actually the logistics hub of the country. So while most products may be made in China, for example, they have to go through either the Port of Los Angeles or the Port of Oakland and then get on a train and the only way to get to the East Coast is you have to go through Chicago because Chicago is where all the railroad tracks converge. And so in fact, um, Chicago has a booming logistics industry that requires factory jobs and manufacturing jobs to, to meet this demand. Companies like Target, Walmart, Amazon, the companies that you use every day with a with a booming digital economy that you can get your, your goods in two days, the two day shipping comes in at an expense and it's usually at the expense of a worker. Any kind of abuse you can think of, we captured it in our report. Um, one story that really struck, struck me is Victoria, right? She works at a pizza factory in Romeoville, Illinois, right? Uh, interesting uh, location, a lot of warehousing and logistics industry, big boom there. and. Um, Victoria was working at this frozen pizza factory, uh, putting ingredients onto the pizzas and then building the boxes. And this is a pretty standard job in the Chicago area, manufacturing job, factory job. Um, and the motion of putting the boxes together and the motion of putting the ingredients on the pizzas, right? You're just doing the same repetitive motions all day. And so naturally, your wrists would start to deteriorate. This is just, um, it, it comes with the work, right? And so Victoria um, went to the doctor because she was experiencing pain and uh, the doctor said, well, you can no longer do this kind of work, otherwise you'll have permanent damage to your wrists. So Victoria went to her floor manager and she, she shared this information when she had the doctor's note and said, I can't, I'm experiencing pain, I need different work. And so the boss called her worthless. The boss said, you are, are disposable. We're going to put you in isolation because you can't do the work that we need. So whatever, like go. And they put her in isolation in, in the, fr uh, the frozen section. And they didn't warn her. She didn't even have warm clothes. And so she was put in isolation because she complained. And then when she complained about the isolation, she was fired. Right? So you see the sort of escalation from 
being called worthless, that your opinions don't matter, that your labor is invaluable, to being put in isolation so you can't organize with your coworkers, to straight up being fired. These practices aren't legal, um, and there are laws on the books that uh, demonstrate such, but, uh, and worker centers have, have been part of the front lines to win a lot of these policy changes, but ultimately, if uh, workers can't uh, claim those rights, if they can't stand up for their rights, then then it just becomes a piece of paper and of no use to the lived experiences they have on the ground. So there's a current uh, campaign, organizing campaign happening at a f uh, factory called IFCO that is a distributor for Walmart and they produce pallets that uh, ship the uh, groceries from the factory to the grocery store and these factories are Unfortunately, it's just one story of hundreds, but the conditions are terrible, right? Workers are, uh, are uh, packing these pallets, um, standing up to their ankles in feces because the sewers have overflown. They don't have uh, access to, or they don't have access to training or health and safety equipment, and so they are operating chemicals uh, and inhaling them unsafely. And they are operating machinery that's uh, being, they're being asked to shove their hands into machinery that's still moving, that has the potential to chop off their arm, but you gotta get that two day shipping, and so you gotta move as fast as you can. The nature of the industry is that in order to compete, you have to break the law, right? You have to build wage theft into your business model, you have to build an unsafe working conditions into the business model to stay competitive and so the way to keep competitive and to, the way to break the law is to, to develop a culture of fear so that workers can't come forward or don't feel comfortable coming forward to stand up for their rights. And so we see it every day. It's the biggest barrier to organizing and, and it's the biggest barrier for workers to stand up for their rights. Um, so for us, until we address re workplace retaliation, we can't fully impact any other issue area. So in this particular moment where we see that union density is on the decline and that this culture of fear is just permeating every workplace, we need uh, organization that can hold space for the trauma that workers are experiencing. Um, we need organizations to have the kind of slack that's required to test new membership models, to test new organizing campaigns. The exciting thing about Race the Floor is that it sort of gives that added capacity so that worker center organizers can focus on what they do best, which is organizing, so that they um, have access to any com components that you would need for any strong campaign, like a research shop that demonstrates why we need change, like a communication shop that centers the voices of workers and elevates their stories uh, in the media. Uh, like a policy shop that can have a presence at the Capitol and, to, and can make sure that workers um, are being centered in all of their discussions about policy change. I, I think that worker centers alone um, cannot meet the scale of abuse that we, that we know exists in these kinds of industries, but we need government agencies to formalize these relationships and fundamentally recognize that um, in a complaint-driven model, you need community partners and you need workers. At the Worker Center Movement, we fundamentally believe that workers are the experts of their own lives and they should be the ones driving the policy solutions that they need. And so we believe that um, any enforcement or uh, any enforcement change, any policy change, needs to center their, their voices, their experiences. Um, and in addition to that, we sort of see three key ingredients, the first of which of course is workers and the tacit knowledge they carry of their workplaces and industries. But the second um, is community partnerships, that worker centers um, in particular are trusted community organizations that are in the community, they share language, they share cultural nuances, um, and they build deep, deep trust. The kind of trust you can't get by just telling a worker, go show up at this government building downtown, take a train, show ID at the front door. That's not a very trusting environment. You need an organizer with you who will make you, make you understand of your own sense of your own power, that you are the expert of your own life and you know what you need and you know that this practice is illegal, right? And so it's up to you to stand up for those rights and feel confident that, that you know what, what justice looks like and you're going to achieve it. As worker centers, we engage individuals in their role as workers, but we fully recognize them as whole human beings 
beings that are part of particular neighborhoods or are part of particular um, racial or ethnic groups and part of uh, particular religious institutions. Um, and we aren't just fighting to uh, improve the material conditions. So that's certainly important to us, but ultimately organizing is about altering the relations of power. It's about helping our communities understand that we, we, ha we are the source of everything we need. Um, and we dream of a democratic, joyful, beautiful workplace in which workers have dignity and respect and that they are the ones who are centered in our work and not profits.